Well, this morning we're continuing our series, Life Actually, looking at what it means when the rubber meets the road in your faith. And and if you have any desire to actually live your life in Christ, at some point it's got to become real. It doesn't matter what you say, it's got to be part of your actions and become something you're living out. And so following Jesus should change the trajectory of your life. Now, last week we talked about actually trying in your marriage. And while we made a solid argument that Even though it was about marriage, it applied to all relationships and and everybody should be paying attention, and many of you did, Uh, there were some of you who were like, ah, this really isn't about me, and so you let yourself off the hook. And so I thought this week we would hit a topic that affects all of us, and that topic is your money. Now, what you're gonna realize fairly quickly today is that this issue is a whole lot bigger than your money. It's a whole lot bigger than money in general, Uh, but the place that it rears this problem, rears its ugly head the most, is in our finances. So if you're thinking, hey, this doesn't apply to me because I don't have any money. I I wanna remind you that most of the world lives on less than $2 a day and this still applies to them. So it probably applies to you as well. But here's the, the, the statement that I want, the truth statement that I want out there to guide us this morning. You ready? You actually have to honor God with your finances. And if you underline one word or circle one word in that statement, I do not want you to circle the word finances, I want you to circle the word honor because today is so much more about honor than it is about finances. And yet there is a real sense in which God in his wisdom purposely chose money as an area to test my honor, your honor. Because most of us hold on to money just a little too tight. Most of us think that we don't have quite enough of it. Most of us worry about you know, money just a little too much. And so we're, we need to let go of this thing. We need to know how to honor God with it. So we're gonna turn to the book of Acts today to set us up with a story. So turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter four. If you use one of our Bibles, we'll be on page 656. Uh, if you didn't bring your Bible, you can raise your hand. The ushers will come around and hand you one. If you don't own a Bible, please raise your hand and we'll give you one and this will just be a gift to you. Acts chapter four. Uh, The story we're going to dive into is actually in Acts chapter 5, but I need to set up with some context from chapter 4. Now, when you think about the the book of Acts and the early chapters of the book of Acts, most people tend to think of the story of what we would refer to as the birth of the church. Like up until this point, Acts has been full of victories and and celebrations, and, and we see redemption stories, we see salvation, we see prayer, we see healings. The church is growing like crazy, faith is spreading, life is good. And then in Acts chapters three and four, you see the religious leaders trying to stop the spread of the church, okay? And you see uh, some persecution, but the church has so much momentum and, and, and there's the presence of the Holy Spirit. It seems like no outside force could ever stop this momentum, which is why in chapter five, the enemy will attack from the inside. We're gonna see that in a minute. But as we get to the end of chapter four, we see a profound picture. Acts, Acts chapter four, starting with verse 32. It says, all the believers were united in heart and mind and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them because those who own land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Now, this is incredibly powerful, but I want you to notice it wasn't a rule that they were putting in place. There there was just simply such a spirit of unity, a spirit of surrender, that that people were just compelled to care for one another, to take care of one another. People were simply more important than stuff. They recognized everything they had was a gift from God, and they didn't see themselves as owners of that stuff. They just felt like we're we're stewards of what God has given us, and, and, and so we just should take care of it. Now, I've actually heard some people look at this chapter and say, well, clearly that they were socialists. You know, it was a so, they were living by socialism. This wasn't socialism, it was surrender. It was, it was just a, a spirit of surrender. Socialism and communism says what's yours is mine and I'll take it. But church unity says what's mine is yours and I'll share it. And there's a very big difference from those two mindsets. And so from time to time, as, as God would bring a, a need to their attention, uh, the people were compelled to just respond to that need. The, the, they just felt like they had enough, they were blessed, or that they had more than enough. They, they would just give it. They would let go of their extra. They would bring it to the apostles to bless others. One well-known example of this is the story of a guy named Barnabas. Uh, in Acts chapter 4, verse 36 and 37, it says, for instance, There was Joseph, the one apostle nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. 
He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. Now, this is a pretty amazing story. Let me give you some context. Barnabas sold a field he owned, gave the money to the apostles, but what's noteworthy is that he was a Levite and Levites didn't get an inheritance of property. When they were handing out all the, the property, when they came into the promised land and all the tribes were getting their share of the promised land, the Levites were purposely left out because they were servants of God. And so they were provided for by offerings to the church, but they didn't have any land. There was nothing that they owned. So how does he have a prop piece of property? Well, this land was likely land from his wife's family in Cyprus. So think of it like being lucky enough to marry someone and she, her family owns a lake cabin. Okay, Barnabas sold the lake cabin and used the money for the needs of others. Now, when we read scripture, he gets all the credit, but let's not neglect, his wife gave up the lake cabin. That's pretty, pretty impressive. But this is just one example of this type of generosity. So here's a question. Dead, generous people get taken advantage of. Absolutely. In fact, Paul has to come back in 1 Timothy and he has to set some boundaries for the generosity of believers because the believers were actually being too generous to a fault. But they were just excited. They were caught up in the mission of the church and, and, and they just wanted to give what they had. And I needed to, to paint this picture of generosity for you in chapter four to set up for our story for today, which is found in Acts chapter five, starting with verse one. But there was a certain man named Ananias who, with his wife Sapphira, sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Now, at first glance, that sounds very f familiar to what, or similar to what Barnabas did. Ananias and Sapphira sell some property. They decide to help out. They come and they leave money at the disciples' feet, but they don't lay all the money there. And he doesn't give all the money, but he claims he gave all the money. And there's the problem. Verse three, then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? <laughs> you lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. So with that scripture, the ushers are going to come around now and you better give it. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm kidding. I'm serious. But what happened here? What, what, what is going on? Many people misunderstand this harsh response from God. And they think that God killed Ananias because he didn't give all the money. But that's not the reason for the punishment at all. Peter says to Ananias in verse four, hey, it's your property. You can do with it whatever you want. You didn't even have to sell it. It was your choice. And once you did sell it, it's yours to give whatever you wanna give. You didn't have to give any of it. You give as much or as little as you want. The sin wasn't that he held some of his money back. The sin was that he lied to God about it. Pick it up, verse seven. <clears throat> about three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her inside her husband and great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. Now, I mean, you, I've had people accuse me of having my sermons be pretty, pretty tough, you know, pretty harsh. Uh, imagine you were here today and you're, you're a visitor for the first time. And at the end of the gathering, uh, the guy in front of you drops a check in the bucket. And as he approaches the door to leave, I look at him and I say, was that all the money? And he says, yes. And I call him a liar and he drops dead. Then his wife comes out of the bathroom and I ask her too. And she says, yes. And I call her a liar and she drops dead. I'll tell you what you're not thinking at that, at that moment. This was a great church. We should bring the neighbors next week. You're not thinking that at all. You're thinking we got to get out of here. Okay. So listen, it says great fear gripped the church, which is really an understatement. So my goal today is not to scare you. This is not a veil threat like you're going to need to start tithing real soon or me and God are going to have a tithe. That's not what this is at all. The reason I'm sharing this story is because we have to understand what is happening and what God took so seriously. Okay? So to do so, 
<clears throat> I'm going to quick take you to a couple of other stories where people are struck dead for disobeying. And I promise this sermon does get better. But first, we're going to go to a couple of our stories. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, put coals of the fire in their incense burner and sprinkled incense over them. In this way, they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire, different than he had commanded. So fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up, and they died there before the Lord. So Nadab and Abihu, all they did was added some incense to the fire. They were guilty of adding a little twist of their own. They, all they did was ask, throw a little scent beads in the fire. That was it. Like, they just made it, make it smell a little better. The problem is they tried to do God's thing their way. And in verse 3, God says, when anyone comes near to me, they need to remember that I am a holy God. Or what about the story of Uzzah in 2 Samuel 6? They're transporting the ark of God on a cart. This ark represented God's presence here on earth. No one was supposed to touch it, but they hit a speed bump. 2 Samuel 6, verse 6 to 7. When they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah reached out his hand and steadied the ark of God. Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him dead because of this. So Uzzah died right there beside the ark of God. What is up with that? Uzzah's just trying to help out. He, wasn't, he was well-intentioned. He wasn't trying to disobey. He just didn't want the ark to fall on the ground. Uzzah forgot he was unholy and the ark was holy because God is a holy God. Here's what you need to understand. In all of these stories, God seems unreasonable to us because he punishes what seem like pretty small offenses in an incredibly severe way. You could say he makes an example of these people. The question is, Why? Using the wrong fire doesn't seem like that big a deal to me. Helping catch the ark before it fell, I was just trying to help. Now, lying about how much you were giving and all that, that's, that's pretty bad, but it doesn't seem like something that should cost your life. And, but the problem is all of these sins are areas where we can rationalize in things in our mind, and this is the reason I bring up these extreme stories. It doesn't matter what you can rationalize in your own life. God is holy and he deserves to be treated as holy in all things. So Ananias and Sapphira did what they did with their money because they saw what Barnabas did. They saw how he sold his land and, and he, he gave to the people and he saw how the people looked at him. And he wanted the, they wanted the people to look at them the same way. And if there's something God can't tolerate, it's people in the church who do all the right things for all the wrong reasons, who do not do them to honor God, but do them to keep up appearances. Now, what does that have to do with money? Nothing. In fact, honoring God with your finances isn't about money. It's about honor. Finances just happen to be a hard place to honor him. So if you're like most people, we tend to rationalize with God, especially when the pastor starts talking about things like a, a 10% tithe. And, and God is aware of our tendency to rationalize. For example, in Malachi 3, verse 8 to 10, God says this, should people cheat God? Yet you've cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When do we ever cheat you? You've cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You're under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Literally, he says, you have robbed me. Now listen, if everything you have belongs to him and you're just a steward than anything he asks you for that you don't give the way he asks you is actually an area where you've stolen from God. That can be true of time. That can be true of money. It can be true of things. It doesn't, doesn't matter. But a lot of times we get caught up in this idea. A lot of times we get caught up in, in the idea of the tithe and the 10%. And, and some people say, was well, it 10% of net or is it 10% of gross or which is it? And then others will say, well, 10% is an Old Testament rule, which is true. In the New Testament, it asks for way more than 10%. It tells you to be generous and sacrificial. And so I'm not going to sit here today and tell you how much you should give or where you should give it or even if you should tithe, but that's not the point. The point isn't the finances. It's a call to honor God in every area of your life, including the way you handle your finances. So for some of you, that will mean starting to practice tithing. For some, it will mean going beyond tithing and being generous where God's telling you to be generous. 
it will lead some of you to meet the needs in your community, in the area of town you live, and to openly give of your excess for the sake of your neighbors. The point is not the tithe. The point is obeying and honoring God. If God asks you for a tithe and you give less, that dishonors God. If God asks you to give towards someone's missions trip and you don't do it, that dishonors God. <clears throat> if God asks you to <clears throat> live on what you have and give the first fruits to him and you live above your means and you're drowning in debt, that dishonors him. So whatever your current financial situation is, answer this question. Is God glorified by the current reality of my finances? Is he glorified by the current reality of my finances? Living a life that is actually transformed by Jesus means living a life where God is glorified in every area of my life. That the spirit of God is literally invading every part of my life. So why should our finances and our financial realities be the exception to that rule? What Ananias and Sapphira were trying to do here was actually a good thing. They were performing a wonderful act of charity, one they were in no way required to give, but their motive was for their own personal glory. And that, there, there's a beautiful passage in 1 Timothy 6 that I think captures God's heart on this issue and explains why God cares so much about finances. 1 Timothy 6, starting with verse 6. He says, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Now, I don't want you to miss a couple of powerful ideas. First, godliness with contentment is the goal, okay? Living out your faith is not about following all the rules and then it's not about putting pressure on yourself to get everything right. True faith is finding contentment in him alone. It's walking with Jesus, doing what he calls you to do, following in his footsteps and being so content in who he is that everything else is just details. The word for contentment literally translates self-sufficiency, which is not about, you know, you know, you don't need your commitment to come from external things. When you're not, when you're self-sufficient, when you're, you're not swallowed whole by the itch for more, you can live in peace with enough. You know that God is enough. That whatever I have right now, whatever God has given me, it's enough. So when we're deeply grieved by material loss, it's because we lack contentment. When we think we need something in order to be happy, it's because we're not content. When, we're buy, when buying things and owning things brings an inordinate amount of pleasure, it's because we're not content. And Paul speaks of this experience in his own life over in Philippians chapter four. He says, not that I was ever in need for I've learned how to be content in, with whatever I have. <clears throat> I know how to live <clears throat> on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, please, please hear me. There is nothing wrong with having cool stuff or having nice stuff. Like if you own cool stuff, you got a, a cabin or a boat or a camper or ATV or whatever, you have cool stuff, I wanna borrow it sometime. Like, let me know, let me know, cause that would be great. Uh, the problem is when you have to have cool stuff. The problem is when you have so much cool stuff that you're paying for that you can't honor God and put him first with your finances. And this can be doubly difficult living in our culture that literally rewards discontentment and worships the idea of getting more. So first, you have to realize that godliness with contentment is the goal. Second, you gotta realize the love of money is the root of evil. Money itself is not evil and I pray all the time that God would bless godly people with money so they can bless kingdom endeavors with it, whether that be their local church or missions work or church planting or whatever it might be. One of the coolest things is when people are so kingdom minded that they actually include ministries in their estate planning at the end of their lives because they want their legacy to keep going. But <laughs> so it's not the money that's evil. It's the love of money. It's the desire for more than we could ever need that misleads us. It's when we value comfort 
over kingdom impact. It's when we value what we have over what our neighbor needs. It's when we value having riches here far more in our lives than we care about storing up treasures in heaven. God cares so much about finances because he knows just how easily we can trade him for money. That's why Jesus warns us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. For you'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So back to our story of Ananias and Sapphira. I think there are three lessons here from this story. As hard as the story can be to swallow, we can learn from it. Three lessons uh, about uh, what we need to know about money. Number one, God sees everything, okay? He sees everything. So th think about your life for a moment. Think about how scary that is, that God sees everything, like all of it, okay? He knows every action. He knows every thought we think. And if that doesn't tell you how much we need his grace, nothing will. God sees past your outer appearance, past the actions that you do on the outside to your heart. And in fact, his greatest desire is that you actually just walk with Jesus, that you actually love God with all you are, that you actually love your neighbor as yourself, that you actually choose to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And without question, that includes what you do with your finances. So whatever you do or don't do with your finances, God sees it. So I go back to our earlier question. Is God glorified by the current reality of my finances? Do you know what he's asking of you and are you doing it? Number two, you are living for an audience of one. Why did Ananias and Sapphira lie about their gift? Because they wanted to look spiritual, spiritual to everyone else. They wanted to look like Barnabas. So let me ask you a question, an honest question. Why do you go to church? Why do you serve? Why are you in a group? If you're currently giving, why are you giving? Please hear me. I want you to do all those things because I think they'll help you all grow in your faith, but I don't want you to do them for us. I don't want you to do them so others think you have a better walk with Jesus. Church is not about spiritually performing for one another. We want you to do what God asks you to do in every area of your life because you're walking with Jesus and because you want to be more like him. Because you're so in love with the God who's asking you to do it. Because you're only living for an audience of one. Number three, giving is all about the heart. Giving is never about money with God. He doesn't need your money. God, God is about faith. He's about obedience. He's about surrender. And he's about trust. God ultimately cares about your heart. And he ultimately wants your love. So if you're going to go all in with Jesus in your life, you have to figure out how to honor God with every area, including your finances. When you give, give because he called you to, give because you love him. When you give, offer it as a sacrifice to him. When you give, do it with a trust that his plan is better. When you give, remember that giving is about what God is doing in us and that giving is teaching us things like self-denial, stewardship, and sacrifice. The lesson of generosity is that this life is not about you. It's a life that's meant to be lived in a way that honors God alone. The rewards of a kingdom life cannot be purchased here on earth. And even if they could, even if they could, we can't take them with us. But giving teaches us I'm living for the life to come. My reward is ultimately in heaven and my reward is Jesus and he is enough.